To write eternity on a piece of paper is so easy. Then everything else follows. Poets, drunkards, lovers, flowers. I think of Steve as a really like a, bombs, a marker toilets, of a particular time and a particular fingers, kind of attitude that is really rare uh, to find now. To find eternity is very hard. To be eternity is very hard. Driving upstate, stuck in traffic, desperate need to hear a voice that would change our perception of time. If we enjoy ourselves, then our story will be easier to take, swallow, history, tragedy, I put myself thinking, logo, what theosophy, kind of piece democracy, would I write about immediacy. This? Get drunk and anything sounds good. The music was bad and uh, I lost one of my favorite Don't hats. Don't think about the ultimate highest jazz ball. If anyone wants to get me one, please feel free to do so. They, he was never thrifty with his emotional uh, engagement in the arts and with, with artists and writers and musicians. And that seems to me said. difficult to find now in people. I don't even like being called a poet. Being a poet is very important, and you know, and there's too many of us doing these things. Although it's better than if we were murderers or rapists. Easy to write death, and then eternity follows. As easy to run away. Symbolized for a lot of us, a lot of us younger people in New York, a way of living as a poet that was very inspiring and kind of unusual at the time. Maybe if we reach the river, we can take the stone. And drop it in. She swims slowly around the island. The poem that transports me immediately in into another slowly. world. She swims slowly rhyme, in circles around the island. Urgent slowly, circling with quiet Science strokes. Right Syrup around the repetitions. island, strapped to herself. Repetitions. This is like paradise. Thought she says flows like later, a saxophone melody. Walking back to the car. This is like paradise. Steve held the keys to the she gate all She swims slowly alone. around the island. When I asked the man for directions on how to get to eternity, he said just keep walking. I had a very pure approach to street. writing that was not and interested in street, trends or being walking, well known necessarily. And when does not like to be branded as a jazz poet and you'll get to the end of the street and when you get to the end of the street just keep walking you well get the idea well read and deeply knowledgeable but completely self-taught this is hip if new this york a was a language run it through he your mastered fingers it. And play it and it fountain it. through this him this document of heat this is a jazz poem covered in circumstance circumference of Oh, roundabout, head trip, cooler than tonight, into nebula hotness. It's it, this thing called free, so enjoy yourself. There was hardly a show which Steve didn't storm in for at least a minute, On Friday, just to May head to another one to make sure he, he was there when it happened. Like three or four concerts a day sometimes, or a reading, then and then he had to run off and go to a concert and something and else. So it was, I live in a world that is, is playing dead. The stone. Then How can I miss that? The set with Evan Parker, Screaming you can see from Governor's and Island. And then to part see an art show in between and to talk to people in between. I mean, when I think about it, it's like almost exhausting. Thing to think about the day in the life of Steve Dalshinsky. <laughs> Take part in the marathon reading. Soaked in enough of the music to attempt the impossible. He had taken in an ecstatic free jazz concert by the Sandra Orchestra. Don't look for tragedy. It's right here where you left it, in the amphitheater, surrounded by a chorus of music and words and misunderstanding. The dead confront the dead. The when dead, one person is spirits, right, one is wrong, really that's a melodrama. The when air is full right, with their that's tragedy. Their sighs, when their Democrats their decide sorrows, just to enjoy air, ourselves air, air, and, the dead, and in the flood, dead, they are not our story really will be easier to handle. You go where you must. You always go where you must. In the end, you go where you must. You go. You go. You go where you must. You are listening to Extended Techniques, a podcast about contemporary music through the lenses of temporal innovations. 
Not too long ago, a very observant culture critic wrote in Forward. If you find yourself at an avant-garde jazz concert and poet Steve Delachinsky is not in the audience, you probably have the wrong address. Knowing that we will now always have the wrong address at any show, we want to remember some moments when Steve, the collages of words and sounds, was on stage. Fruit flies seem to be coming out of my body, out of my very skin. Ripening banana, squeezed orange, damned fruit flies, leaving my chest through my nipples, into every room I enter, around the kitchen sink. I give them purpose, create a purpose, they acquire purpose. Alphabet without knowledge of itself, numbers without sequence, mind too scattered to give meaning to. Seventh and K, where I grew up, lava to adult, among Jews, among Italians, among Jews, among letters, numbers. Perhaps Fruit Flies was one of Steve's favorite poems. He infuses new meaning in it with every reading. When Steve read it at the Stone in February last year... There was the Stone at Avenue C, uh, one of the final nights before it closed, wasn't it? Right. It was Lower East Side Elegy 3, Frank London's Shekhinah Big Band. The entire performance, with already quite ecstatic music, acquired some kind of hope and purifying light. But going back to the 90s, here is what New York Times wrote about Steve's performance at the Passover Seder at the Knitting Factory in 1997. Steve Delachinsky, another writer, recited a work about the Ten Plagues, particularly Fruit Flies, which mixed Yiddish and yoga. My favorite Y words. I guess they refer to kishkes and chakras. The next time I remember seeing Steve was the staging of Russian absurd display Lapa on a snowy February evening of 2001 in East Village. I thought I knew Daniel Harms's works pretty well, but Lapa was new to me, a brilliant avant-garde dream play that Matvey Inkilevich staged for one night only. It is there that I noticed how distinct and theatrical was Steve's voice. Let's hear how the director remembers this production. In fact, the snow was a really, it was an interesting moment because it started snowing that late that evening or, or late afternoon and the drummer was stuck in traffic. Um, so he brought in his drums about 20 minutes into the performance and set up and it looked like it was part of the play just setting up the drums and starting to play with the group <laughs> while everything was already happening, which was kind of beautiful. Um, uh, you know, I didn't know Steve's work as a poet before that event and only came to know it more afterwards. And um, But I liked the tone of his voice, and I was looking for different voices that had different, just different uh, textures. So Steve's voice as an older voice and kind of gravelly and a different ac kind of Brooklyn accent and all of that, that made it just varied the voices and, and, and helped kind of create different tonalities. 11 years later in 2012, having seen Steve at countless jazz performances and his own readings, I asked him to read selections of Brazilian surrealist poet Joan Cabral de Melo Neto, at the event I ran at Brazilian Endowment for the Arts. Steve was intrigued, as he never heard about this poet before, and I reminded him of Lapa experience that he liked, so he agreed to participate. He didn't rehearse. I want to be surprised, Steve said. So he was reading the poems for the first time at the event, and it sounded just perfect. And he said that he enjoyed the reading and was pleasantly surprised to discover a new poet. It seemed natural to invite Steve back to Brazilian Endowment for the Arts next year, in 2013, to read texts by another Brazilian modernist, Clarice Lispector, and his own poetry as well. Steve added his personal tinge to the text, almost as if transforming Lispector's prose to poetry. He repeated some words and lines and made sounds 
like he often did with his own poems. It almost felt like Clarice's text became Steve's own text, as if the boundary of authorship disappeared. One day the comfort in God, and no matter how paltry it is, we must learn that this is from the beginning in the warm shelter of our birth. To be useful and useless is freedom. To have meaning would belittle us. We are gratuitously just for the pleasure of being. And from the future, we will consciously wait for the lack of meaning, of freedom in speaking, in feeling this, ah, happiness is nothing more than feeling an ah with relief, an ah, then, then, then let us raise our glasses and modestly toast an ah to this God, though it's hard for me to finish, it hurts so much to say goodbye, doesn't it? Doesn't it hurt to say goodbye? Well, well, maybe because in me it hurts. Ah, the ah hurts. So why God? Why God? Why not just sit smoking and dying of hunger? Ah, it's because you want to be able to say ah, ah, ah. Do we exist simply to be relieved? I pay attention only to pay attention, only to pay attention. Pay attention, pay attention, deep, deep, deep. Deep, 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 deep down. I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything. We came back to Brazilian and Portuguese surrealist poetry in 2017 at Burl's Poetry Shop in Brooklyn at the event called Reflections on Trans Experience. Steve read poems by Fernando Pessoa, Paul Leminski, and Nelson Usher. The last two he also encountered for the first time and instantly liked. When he was reading Leminski's short poems, he would repeat them several times, as if a refrain in a song. And Aaron Novick's music was very apt. Let me vanish, let me melt, let me fall apart until after me, after us, after all, nothing but charm is left. Let me vanish, let me melt. Let me fall apart until after me, after us, after all, nothing but charm is left. Nothing the sun could not explain. Everything the moon makes glamorous. No rain fades this flower. Nothing the sun could not explain. Everything the moon makes glamorous. No rain fades this flower. Let me vanish, let me melt, let me fall apart. Later that year, I introduced Steve to my friend, a leading experimental guitarist from Rio de Janeiro, Marcus Campello. They instantly became friends and played a few gigs together, including our event on the themes of spirit possessions in Spectrum. The event was called Kintawant in New York. It was in February 2018 to celebrate Steve's and Marcus LP release. She covered, she covered, she covered, covered, she, she, covers, she covers her face, she turns her head, she turns. The noises of silence, the loudness of silence, the birds of silence, the silence of silence. Marcus plans to issue another record they've made together. Let's hear a short piece they recorded at Steve's apartment. In the grain of our ancestors, in the tranquility of flatness, a warmth, a chill, a chill across the great green table and the backs of our necks, a chill in winter mist, in front of the funeral parlor, an old man's face falling apart. In the grain of our ancestors, in the tranquility of flatness, a warmth, a chill, Across the great green table, in the backs of our necks, 
in winter mist in front of the funeral parlor, an old man's face falling apart. with warm his collaboration with Marcus many times, and Marcus, like many musicians, poets and artists in New York's Lower East Side, was inspired by Steve's pure artistic pursuit and disregard of any obstacles that could disturb his creative process. People would notice uh, if you stop doing it, but when you're doing, they don't really know about it. It's like a monk praying for people that uh, nobody cares about it, but when he stops praying, then people will notice. We'll let Matvey Inkelevich from Ugly Duckling Press, that published several of Steve's books, talk about his poetic legacy. He came out of a sort of avant-garde music and small press poetry kind of scene that never distinguished between the aesthetics and the politics that was always very conscious of the political nature of a kind of aesthetic uh, antagonism to the mainstream or to overly art with a capital A and like establishment kind of institutionalized art frameworks. Uh, He was always interested in the spaces that were a little bit more underground and in the kind of networks that that fostered and so i think his poetry you know brings out a lot of that network a lot of that kind of the way he mentions other people in his poems the way he mentions musicians the way that that is an intimate way not like a name dropping but like an intimate knowledge of all of these networks and all of this listening that he had done and so i think it's actually important this this um attitude in his poetry of revealing or uncovering injustices that have to do with and and just the world of uh, that he was living in especially in i think in soho seeing the changes that were happening in soho and feeling the in, the kind of general injustice of how arts were being driven out of new york the sort of marginalization of people like himself and he really felt that as as a kind of I think he really felt that as a kind of basic problem of modernity or the contemporary moment, a kind of disregard for pure artistic pursuits. And he would rail against them in his poems. Things that I particularly recall from his readings and reading him on the page really invested in a certain idea of beauty, of awe in front of the artistic creation. And I think that's, uh, it's kind of a, it sounds maybe banal or old fashioned, and maybe that was a kind of old fashioned aspect of Steve, but he really wanted his poems to be not separate from other works of art, but kind of in reference to and among and like a kind of like a, a place, the poems became a place where he could describe that awe and that belief in the arts and and the kind of deep, for him, really deep felt sense of inspiration from others, from others and from other artworks, from music, from concerts, records, paintings, poems, you know, everything. So, like, I think the poetry has this really beautiful way of juxtaposing those injustices of the world with, with what is, what was for Steve ethically good, which was this sort of un- unfettered creativity. Pray for me, for I have been ambushed. Pray for me the way he played for the head bobbing kid in the first row. Pray for me because the older I get, the less tomorrows there are. Pray, pray for me, for I am what there was before the world came into existence. Pray 
if it's a prayer you are praying with the quirkiest blues ever in tongue. Pray for me in jagged voice and broken tongue, in soft lament, complaining moan, and joyful agonizing tree. Pray for me, jagged stone that I am, until I am withered and gone, and even after that, pray for me. Pray for the zigzag lines of my life, for as long as they remain a pattern on your less than shiny skull. And when they're gone, pray for me anyway. Pray for me as if my life depended on it, as if your life depended on it. The mirror is a shore surging and receding. Your voice can be a part of the breaking. Pray for me. Lift me out of the bedrock with my wedlock with the dog. Pray for me in battle jackal that I am, fruitless searcher rooted in the swamp of self-denial and complete disquiet. Pray for me as I am forced to strip and made to walk down the naked highway. Pray for me on those cold nights and summers too. Pray for me the way ecstatic peace seekers raise their voices in jubilation. The way a group of not so holy lovers of death have prayed together for centuries. Pray for me as I vanish from the planes of geometry, preparing to regroup and rehearse. Pray for me when I am struggling like a peach in Satori. Pray, pray for me as I ingest a drug whose side effects are suicidal thoughts, suicidal attempts, and suicide. Pray for me, my private affairs of the heart, impaled and imploding within the body of a thief. Pray for the ruthless way I thrust the homeless from my door. Pray for me, for it was my prayers that killed my brother, and God exists only to judge us. Pray for this inhibited near rabbit stereotype, the engine that starts the fire. Pray for me, I like to take, I don't like to give. Pray for me for that reason alone, if for no other. I realize the insignificance of your prayer, but pray for me, pray for me anyway, pray for me, pray for me, please, pray for me, pray, pray for me, for little I do is ever understood, pray for me, for I am a creature of this island and I shall never get off, pray, pray that my foul thoughts might someday be made amicable, that my foul mouth washed clean, pray, pray. Pray that I may never become a consultant. Pray for me. Pray. Pray as my place of dwelling becomes more domesticated. Speak blood, bone, and soul, the poverty of words. Pray for your once and only uncolonized son. Pray as if your prayers may be overheard, take shape, Rise like a spirit on an upward path. Pray, 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 pray that the lights will never be extinguished. Pray for the false threat that I am, for the toothache to go away, for the smile to return to our faces, for the clear bottom folks that allow us to see, for my generosity toward those on death row. Pray for me. Pray for me, for I have abused substance. Pray for my partner. Pray for the sutures in my heart, for the narrows to widen, for the fuzziness of ownership and the cheap sentimentality that my departure will cause. Pray. Pray for the genuineness. The genuineness. Pray for me. Pray. Oh.